It's my deep pleasure now to introduce our speaker. It's Stephen Poplin. If somebody had said to me, how would you describe him and all his many facets, it would be like trying to lasso the wind. <laughs> He's a multifaceted individual, a friend, teacher, mentor, and fellow sojourner to many people, and indeed, a master astrologer, amongst a few other things that he does. And you'll learn more about him as he shares with you, but I would like to tell you just a little bit more before he comes up here. After he attended six universities in the US and Europe, he found something useful to do with his philosophy degree, astrology. He considers himself a neo-Daoist contemplator of the cosmos with a practical eye on human evolution. He blends 30 years experience with intuition and humor. A minister of the Fellowship of the Inner Light, Stephen is a spiritual hypnotherapist who conducts past life regressions and transpersonal journeys with an international circle. He is presently headquartered in Virginia Beach and he travels a lot. So you got to catch him when you can. And we caught him this morning and we're looking forward to his message. Let's open our hearts and minds to hear it. Welcome, Stephen. Let me move my things out of your way and you have the podium. Thank you. And thank you, Susan. Thank you for that introduction, as well as the uh, lovely piano piece, too, during the meditation. Very nice. So, beyond belief and bedlam. I wonder what time it is. Hmm, yeah, well, well there's a uh, email, no, no. Oh, look, a kitten. I put the phone down. Uh, what time is it? I got to look again. How many of you have done that? Um, I, I don't get a lot of hands. That's right, you know, it's April 2020 and we are live streaming. The time, you did see it, you, you knew it, but it didn't register. It did not register. Seen, but overlooked. Were you distracted? What else are we not seeing? It's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see, says Henry David Thoreau. This brings us to belief. I am speaking to you from a church founded on belief. We have beliefs. Can they be proven? Among other ideals, we affirm that the universe is more than what we can perceive with our five senses. We believe in love and cooperation, beauty and kindness, spirit and things unseen. We take comfort in the invisible world and the beliefs and bonds that make some sort of sense in this complex and sometimes confusing world. But back to my phone. I see a Facebook note. Don't trust everything you see online. Signed, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, well, I trust him. That's Honest Abe. Here's the ne next bit of news. It's something exciting. May 16th, a month from now, there is going to be a wonderful alignment of Jupiter, Venus, and the moon in the form of a smiling face in the skies. I saw it right here. This post is going around the internet. I saw it. I saw it several times and even yesterday. Even with some websites as evidence of this great visual thing. Well, this is my territory. And I looked at that and I said, I don't think so. You know, that can't be. But I looked it up nevertheless. I knew that that could not happen. But I calculated it. I, 
I doubted myself. From my years of experience, this came in, it was published, there's websites, and I doubted myself. I, of course, did my own calculations. No, this is not gonna happen on May 16th. May, may, may that particular rumor stop right here, right now. Yeah, so I recognized at the same time that it was an internal perspective that I had that I, I really knew that that was not true, but I had to look it up. I had to calculate it myself. And that means here that there was that self-doubt. For a moment, yes, I doubted myself. That's not gonna happen again. I joke about that, of course, you know. Uh, but seriously, this is a phenomena that sometimes if you see it and it comes to you and it's published, are you going to doubt yourself from something that you know, from something that you believe, from something that feels right from the inside? I suspended judgment. That's an interesting phrase, to suspend one's judgment. True story. Last week, I was looking at uh, the music information as I was on my laptop, and there on that particular uh, software, would show um, who sang, the genre, the year, the publisher, and uh, other information as the song was playing. And it was Blowing in the Wind. I love that song, Blowing in the Wind. Composed by Cat Stevens. I said, what? But there it was, it was written down, it was in my software on my laptop. And then I said, is there perhaps a backstory? I don't know. So then I looked it up. No, Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. You know, I knew it, I knew that. But, but I saw this and I go, huh, what, really? I looked it up in one more time. I doubted myself. I was looking at some fake news. I don't know why people do these things, but there it was, and yeah, it's not true. Yes, these smartphones, you know, are they really smart, you know? You know that they're programmed, and yes, humans are programmed too. Remember that um, uh, old GIGO, G-I-G-O, which meant garbage in, garbage out. That's how they were programmed. Well, I'm thinking maybe we, we need something like KAIKO, knowledge in, knowledge out. How about that? What a concept. I also have a, an astronomy program uh, in my uh, phone and periodically of course I like to look at the stars and the lineup and the constellations and so forth but periodically uh, this particular program needs to be recalibrated it has a GPS in it and one recalibrates it by doing this circle eight motion like that I like that because it's the infinity sign and so I'm thinking maybe maybe I can do that with my head Maybe you out there in, in TV land, in video streaming land, can also do the same. Let's put our heads on straight. Years ago, I attended a talk. It was a born-again Christian who knew how to speak New Age. And she was there, sincerely, to tell us about how um, fervently People who are born again, fundamentalists, believe in their version of Jesus to such an extent that she gave us this metaphor that the, the danger that non-believers would have was like a train coming down on you and the train was coming and you were going to get hit. I was listening to this and thinking, there is no train. But she was sincere, 
and she was really trying to portray, trying to convey this idea of how seriously uh, her fellow believers thought about hell and damnation, and they were going to keep us from that if only we would convert, if only we would believe. But I couldn't get that past my head, but there is no train. I felt like the boy in the emperor's new clothes. You know that one from Mahan's Christian Anderson. The child in his innocence says the truth, the truth as he sees it. And in this particular instance, I knew that the speaker was very sincere in her desire, and um, I didn't really say anything. I was just silent, just listening to that perspective. Recently, I looked up the word zealot. I've been looking up a lot of things lately. One has to consider the source. I rely on a Blinken. Zealot, the ancient Jewish group, a revolutionary group who wanted to foment a revolution against the Roman occupation. I understand that it didn't work out too well. Simon Zelotes and the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, have been identified as zealots, which can mean enthusiastic, but it can also mean fanatics. Could the founders of the American Revolution also be termed zealots because they wanted to also overthrow a British empire just like the zealots of ancient uh, Israel wanted to throw out the Roman. So the difference, of course, is that the um, American fighters were victorious, and then the zealots go down in history as those zealots, those fanatics, and thus we get the modern word. To the victor goes the spoils, we hear. But then I hear the music. Yes, how many years can a people exist before they're allowed to be free? But we are talking about war here. Yes, how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? Have you seen the news? This is just in the last two weeks. There's a lot of this stuff. It was on the same program, same program within minutes of each other, pictures and news about a bunch of uh, food that was going bad, or it was going bad, or it wasn't being sold, and so they were throwing it out. Milk and produce and other things thrown out at the same time, same program, that children were starving, that people were hungry. And I said, my God, people are throwing out food at the same time that people are hungry. Then I go back to the internet, I, to a statistical online um, site, The World Counts. Around nine million people die every year of hunger and hunger-related diseases. This is more than from AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And yes, more than COVID-19. A child dies from hunger every 10 seconds. I didn't know. Yes, and how many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see. I look at that same news report again. Wouldn't it be right and fair and just to just give this food to the hungry? It's an economic crisis, it's unsold food, and the food would otherwise just spoil. 
but then I hear a contrary objection. Wouldn't that be communism? Okay, and now we are back to beliefs. So we will not talk about the, the specific issue of food going not to the hungry, but being thrown out because we are talking about an ideology. How many times can an, an ideology shove out compassion and common sense? And what would the boy say to that particular emperor? To the media? To the experts? Wait, we hear, that's a political issue. We're not going to go there. Also, in the news this year, colleges are elitist institutions that promote liberalism. No, these are places of higher education. And one of the most important parts of that higher education is to know how to look things up, to cross-reference, to follow studies and facts, and then to arrive at studied conclusions. We should value education. We need to verify facts and stop the distraction. No, not the good distractions, not those kitty pictures. But I'm talking also about the manipulators, the controllers, the people with agendas and their distractions. We are in an unprecedented lockdown of normal society. People are afraid, rightly so. Some are hurting, some are confused. Enter the COVID-19 scammers and opportunists. Very much like the lawyers chasing those ambulances down the roads, there are uh, many uh, instances right now of opportunists who are wanting to pretend that they're the IRS wanting to give you money, just send them your uh, information to your bank and they'll be happy to help you out. Criminals are preying on the trusting. Trust is at stake. Don't let them take that away from you. It's malware, which is downloading malicious viruses and information that wants to take advantage of you. The remedy? An antivirus. Where's your faith? My friend George loaned me a book by the author Doris Lessing. She wrote many popular books. She's really quite a uh, fascinating and intelligent woman. This particular book was Prisons We Choose to Live Inside, written in 1986. I remember reading it decades ago. She wrote these essays about the human condition and how emotional ideas can blow in like storms. In the book, she talked about her uh, young years, I think approximately two years in which she was a very enthusiastic communist. And she wrote about it in the book and said she and her young comrades would get together and they would talk about their slogans and then they would go to their uh, protest meetings and they were really into it. And then it was a phase and she got out of it. She grew out of it. And in her 30s, she said, what was I thinking? How, how could I have believed that stuff, you know? But she felt like it, like it was a wave of feelings, and that was one of the most interesting parts of her books. Then she talks about what her parents and her parents' generation went through. I found this very interesting. Before the First World War, the socialist movements of all Europe and America met to agree that capitalism was fomenting war and that the working classes of all those countries would have nothing to do with it. But the moment 
War was actually there. And the poisonous, fascinating elation had begun. All those decent, rational, honorable resolutions about keeping out of the war were forgotten. And that was one of her main points in one of her essays, that there's a lot of people who enjoy war. Hard to fathom. But the crooks of her message is, is here. And I think this is not only applicable for now, but you have probably seen it several times in your life as well as in history. It seems to me, she writes, more and more that we are being governed by waves of mass emotion. And while they last, it is not possible to ask cool, serious questions. One has to simply shut up and wait. Everything passes. But meanwhile, these cool, serious questions and their cool, serious, dispassionate answers could save us. Looking back over my life, what I see is a succession of great mass events, boilings up of emotion, of wild partisan passion that pass. But while they last, it is not possible more than to think these slogans or these accusations, these claims, these trumpetings, quite soon they will seem to everyone ridiculous and even shameful. Meanwhile, it is not possible to say so. Hmm, she's on to something. TV commentators, haven't we been seeing a lot of those experts? Stay at home, wear masks, social distancing, vaccines are coming, yay, don't worry. But very little advice about real health and healthy eating and uh, lifestyles. Okay, every now and then I hear something about going out and getting some fresh air. Maybe that's just casually mentioned. Unfortunately, the be beaches are now closed. As I recall, alkaline diet was important. And I recall that Edgar Cayce, who was a psychic who was able to give readings about health issues, sometimes hundreds of miles away. One time, uh, someone asked the sleeping Casey, what should the diet be? Answer, those things that will not create too much of an acid or too much of an alkaline condition throughout the system. Rather, be the alkaline than acid, never allowing the system to become overtaxed. We are talking about balance. Balance physically, also emotionally, also intellectually. Balance. Yes, I haven't been hearing a lot about these balance and practical ideas about health. I, I wonder if there is a, another component that maybe they're not giving health advice or eating suggestions because there's a lot of businesses that have a different agenda on what they'd like to sell. Faith and trust. There's this trust exercise. Maybe you've seen that also on the internet. And it's a, a rather funny one. And, they've, and the, in the, this room, this young man standing right straight up, and he's told to close his eyes. And there is kind of a camp counselor behind him. And he's saying, this is a trust exercise. And on the count of three, we want you just to fall. Okay, and so he quietly gets the people behind this guy, and there he is, and they say, one, two, three, and then he falls forward. <laughs> they say, oh, bedlam. <laughs> For a while, I did these hypnosis shows. And I was trying to do them to help people to see visually on the stage what is going on inside of our minds. One particular routine I did was called the copycat. And I would have four of the volunteers all sitting next to each other. 
And one of them would be the trend setter. The other three would take their cues from this particular trend setter that I would choose, and who was following my suggestions, by the way, and they would all pose in the same way. It was very funny. Periodically during the show, I would point to the trendsetter and I would say, oh, is, wouldn't it be great to stretch right now? You know, raise your hand. You can cross your legs if you want. And then they would all do it, all of them. It's really quite a nice visual. I would say, it feels so good to be a unit. Oh, to be a part of a team, united. I wanted to, again, there was a couple of ideas I wanted to portray there about trust and faith and reinforcement. By the way, sociologists refer to groups who adopt another's ideology as carrier groups. Interesting wording, huh? During the shutdown, many people, of course, are staying home. It's family time. But then I heard in the news that there's a rise in domestic abuse. Couples cooped up in the house are combusting. Meanwhile, the alternative story, and we're back here again to the balance. There's many other instances of families bonding, parents teaching, children playing, parents reading stories to their kids, and a totally different dynamic. And I say again and again with that, here we go, choose thou. Belief and trust, don't succumb to the fear. By the way, further ideas about hypnosis. There's the pl placebo. If you believe in it, it works. But then there's the nocebo, if you don't believe in it, it won't work, whether that be medicines or, or, or uh, exercises or whatever. So that's an example of faith and distrust, both. In preparing for this talk, some of my main things, my themes, in case you haven't noticed, is the need to face facts, call out fiction, and alternative facts. That came into our vocabulary, alternative facts. Some people saying that with a straight face. This led me to Thomas Huxley, a mostly self-taught, self-motivated British biologist and scientist. He was an early evolutionist of the 19th century, and he's famous for saying, the great tragedy of science the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. He had some other clever things to say. Science commits suicide when it adopts a creed. To a clear eye, the smallest fact is a window through which the infinite may be seen. I think we're on the verge of a mystic here. And something for our modern days here. What we call rational grounds for our beliefs are often extremely irrational attempts to justify our instincts. And then, something very uh, significant. I am too much of a skeptic to deny the possibility of anything. And with that in mind, he coined the word agnostic because he was enough of a man of science that he knew that he could not prove either way the existence of God. So agnostic is, I really don't know. And that was fair as a man of science, as someone who is thinking, I, try, I strive to be fair. I falter sometimes, but let's all strive for that. But then he gave a nice little recipe that would be really useful at this time. Sit down before a fact like a little child and be prepared to give up every preconceived notion. Follow humbly wherever and to whatever abyss 
Nature leads, or you shall learn nothing. Bravo. On May 16th, there will be no alignment and a smiley face in the sky. Don't bother. Don't go out there. It's not going to happen. That's a fake rumor, and I invite you all to stop those fake rumors. When I saw that again, I immediately responded say, no, it's not going to happen. I had my initial doubts, but now I can truly say, yes, let's check for veracity in general. Let's tell the truth all around. Doris Lessing reminds us, it is always the individual in the long run who will set the tone provide the real development in a society. This just in, also highly contagious, is kindness, love, and laughter. Don't wait to catch it from others. Be the carrier. Let this go viral. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And your wit and wisdom are always welcome here.